something that you were saying before, I think is actually really important here, which is that I've always been about facing the painful, ugly truth. Because it's, it's somewhat a cliche saying, but the only way out is through, you know. So that is feel the pain, go through it. That's how you're going to learn. That's how it's not going to hurt anymore. The only way to not experience the trauma is to experience the trauma, so to speak. Get through it. (laughs) Otherwise, it's still there. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 101, and my guest today is Deborah Stathis. Although Deborah is not a stroke survivor, she knows a thing or two about brain injuries after recovering from a motor vehicle collision when she was just 19 years old. Amongst other great milestones and achievements, Deborah has written a book called Beyond Trauma, Turn Tragedy into Opportunity, and that is why she is a guest on the show today. Now in this episode, you might notice some static or noises that interfere with the interview but I've done my best to remove this interference as much as possible. Unfortunately, the stability of the internet varies in every location, and sometimes it's better to persevere with the interview because the message my guest has is far more important, and therefore rescheduling does not become a consideration. Because of these issues from time to time, I have arranged it so you can now download every episode of this podcast as a PDF. It's perfect if you are like me and like to take notes or highlight parts of the interview for future reference or if you prefer to read rather than listen. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com, click the image of the episode you just listened to, scroll down until you see the orange download transcript button, click the button and follow the prompts and the download will begin. You should also know that recently I have put everything that I learned about what is important in stroke recovery into a course called 10 Steps to Brain Health for Stroke Survivors, and Module 1 is now available at recoveryafterstroke.com. This is a course that is included as part of my Recovery After Stroke coaching program that will help you overcome fatigue, reduce anxiety, and support your memory, amongst other things. This 10-step program has been created to complement any medical interventions and works in conjunction with any other physical therapies that you are undergoing. So if you're a stroke survivor that wants to know how to heal your brain, overcome fatigue and reduce anxiety, this course is for you. If you feel like there is not enough support after you leave the hospital and you're afraid that your recovery will go backwards, then this is where I can help. While you are participating in the course, I will coach you and help you gain clarity on where you currently are in your recovery journey. I'll help you create a picture of where you would like to be in your recovery 12 months from now. And I will coach you to overcome what's stopping you from getting to your goal. Right now, for everyone that is interested in learning what recovery after stroke coaching is all about, you will get a seven-day free trial to decide if it's the right fit for you. So take advantage of the seven-day free free trial now by clicking the link below if you're watching on YouTube or by going to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash coaching if you are listening online. And now it's on with the show. Deborah Stathis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been kind of following your work for a little while and every time I saw one of your posts on social media, I thought, wow, this, I'll be honest, I thought this chick has um, <laughs> has a similar point of view to me, has a similar kind of idea. And I don't think you're a stroke survivor, but I was really intrigued by the stuff that you do. And then at one point I saw you post your book and talk about this concept of yours beyond trauma. And it really started to resonate with me because I always talk about stroke for me as being one of the best things that ever happened to me and I talk about post-traumatic growth as a concept and and in the context of growth and learning, it, I've never done so much growth and learning um, in my life until after my 37th birthday, you know, when I experienced the first of three brain blades and then brain surgery. So can I take you back on 
the journey that got you to writing the book? What happened to you that created the the beyond trauma process that you went through that allowed you to get to that point to write the book? Well, uh, I was involved in a severe uh, car accident. I, um, the short version of the actual accident itself is that I was driving home from work um, a week to the day after my 19th birthday, so uh, I, was, I was quite young. And um, the short sort of version is that um, it, it hadn't rained. My birthday's in January. It hadn't rained for a long time. It was hot in Melbourne and uh, there was it started raining. So it was pretty oily old part of the road in a PN highway in Mount Martha. And I went around a bit of a bend on an old part of the road and I hit an oil slick. Uh, with my my old car, my first car, and I um I got I probably I don't remember anything of that really. I I it took a long time to even remember that day. Uh, however, the, following the police report and the witness accounts, I uh, it seems that I when I hit the oil slick, I lost control. I hit the gravel on the side of the road. I did a one eighty and I bananaed around a telegraph pole. Hit the driver's side in a nineteen eighty five. Toyota Corolla, which had no airbags. So, of course, the uh, steering wheel was in the middle of the car with me trapped there, no airbags, so ouch. So I, I sustained what uh, was a severe head injury. Uh, so uh, that was multiple facial fractures, breaks, um, the, uh, basically the skull base, as you would know, Skull base uh, had uh, multiple breaks within it and through the sinuses, uh, a CSF leak, uh, so a brain leak, basically brain, brain fluid leak, uh, <laughs> spinal uh, uh, brain fluid leak as well. So acquired brain injury as part of that. Uh, yeah, so that's the shorter, <laughs> short version of it. So straight uh, airlifted into the Alfred uh, and uh, multiple surgeries, facial reconstruction, uh, brain surgery to prevent uh, bacterial meningitis and patch up the, uh, the uh, puncture, basically. So the the uh, breaks throughout the skull base and the the uh, my forehead basically punctured the first layer of membrane around the brain. Fun times, <laughs> and uh, and uh, that required patching up to prevent uh, secondary infection. Uh, so having uh, bacterial meningitis, which of course if I got that in the brain. Well, yeah, see you later, basically. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've, um, I've had my face reconstructed. I've had multiple uh, surgeries and implants and all sorts of things put in my face. There's metal, there's pins, there's coral, coral there's all sorts of things in my face. Uh, and um, lots of surgeries to uh, help assist with the movement of my, my eye. Uh, and, of course, the brain surgery to... Uh, ensure that uh, I don't get bacterial meningitis, which uh, the time frame's passed now, so I won't get that. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the, the short version of the of what happened to me. The part where focusing in on what where you said you know, the journey to beyond trauma that started straight away. Yeah. So when I came to enough. I tried to escape the hospital with drips in my hands and my butt hanging out my, my gown too. Deborah, where are you going? Where am I going? I'm going home. Now, of course, I was out of it. Head injury, medicine, I mean, brain injury, you name it, right? And <laughs> faces out here, uh, bruises, you name it. However, in my, maybe that's a core instinct of mine or something, that I was not going to be a victim. That was not me. So that, oh, the talk around me that I could hear around, oh, she'll never be able to do this, never be able to do that. She, then come, doctors coming in and asking me what my name is, who's the person next to me, who was, of course, my mother. Um, what time is it? What, who am I? You know, that was, I had enough recognition to understand that, that these people around me didn't think I knew what was going on. And I suppose part of me didn't because I was drugged off my face and, of course, a head injury. That said, though, straight away, I was like, nah, this isn't me. I'm not going to be this person. I'm not going to be this person here 
that gets poked and prodded at and he's going to live like this. Not happening. Started right. then and there. Very cool. I like that. Um, defiant 19-year-old, you know, who thinks they know everything about the planet and the world and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I like mm-hmm. that. I like that because that's what's really good about being a teenager. You think that even though you're half your head's missing, you're still bulletproof and you're going to continue this fight and you're going to go down this path. So when you woke up from surgery, what was it that you couldn't do? If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com, and download the guide. It's free. Okay, so initially, um, my, my first working moment was, was my first clear moment, um, clearish moment, was sort of looking around and thinking, where on earth am I? And I saw these brown curtain things, and I was thinking, looked around, and I went, oh, whoa, I'm in hospital. I know that sinking feeling. Now, I could move everything, thankfully. I remember sort of thinking, oh, I can move, that's good. <laughs> and then I think it was my mum that somebody asked me, um, you know, do you know where you are? Um, and I said, I think I'm in the hospital. I said, yeah, do you know what happened? I said, well, well I'll take it. I'm hurt. You know, <laughs> I knew I was hurt because, ow. Uh, and I was told, you know, you, were, you had a really bad car accident. And my first, the first thing I said was, did I hurt anyone? Thankfully, I didn't. I said, no, but you're really hurt. And I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of figured that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of figured that. Um, I could, I was, I couldn't, um, I was very forgetful initially. So most of my injuries were, uh, was my head. So um, most of the injuries were my head. So like I broke, to be blunt, I, bro- I smashed in my face and punctured my, the first layer of membrane around my brain and hadn't got an acquired brain injury. That was, the impact was like here, mostly on this side, impact there. So I've got metal pins and plates throughout my face. So initially this eye was closed, uh, uh, fixed and dilated, so I couldn't move it and I couldn't control my eyelid. Um, my jaw was broken, so I probably had minimised movement speaking and I was quite confused. I was very drugged and I had a brain injury and swelling in the brain, so of course I, I was a little bit delirious, so I hallucinated a little bit as well. I was seeing war scenes and all sorts of things. It was quite, I remember some of it was quite bizarre. Uh, physical movement, though, I, I could move. Um, I had panic, uh, kind of like panic attacks where I was, uh, I thought I was still trapped in the car, so I would thrash about, so they ended up having to put me on the floor because I was a danger to myself. <laughs> so, yeah, so physically wise, initially, I, I was, it was more, co- it was cognitive than anything else. So I was, you know, a, a bit uh, confused, uh, very, very tired, uh, not being able to, perhaps speak as clearly because my jaw was broken and my eye. So initially they thought I couldn't see at all. But I can. How long were you in hospital? Whew. I was in hospital for about five weeks and then I went to the rehabilitation centre. And at rehab, what did you do? What, what were the things that they were trying to get you back on track with? Well, initially I was uh, really, I was really skinny because I basically ate uh, liquid and, you know, purified you know, mushed food because of my jaw because it was sort of wired too, like there was you know, screws in my jaw and 
I think it's straight now. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I was very thin, um, post-operative uh, uh, anemic as well. So yeah, skinny, tired, you know, very, very low energy, uh, very dizzy as well. Um, so it was about getting my physical strength back and also concentration. So working with my memory. Um, so initially there was uh, a bit of uh, post-traumatic amnesia, especially around that time of the accident. So I couldn't initially remember the first couple of weeks. I didn't remember my birthday, which was just, you know, a week prior. Uh, it was a blank. There was nothing there. But over time it came back. So there was a, a bit of physical movement. There was, um, there was uh, I suppose, the OT side of things, so uh, a number of, you know, Things like juggling and looking at numbers and those sorts of exercises to help um, the brain start to work again. Wow. So were you just out of school and near uni or going to uni or any of that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was working in real estate and I was studying fashion. So no more back to school for you for a little while? Uh, not for a little while. Uh my, I'm very proud to say that I, uh, I pursued rehabilitation outside of the rehab centre. So whilst I got the ticks, um, you know, from a number of the experts, that stubborn, uh, that wasn't enough for me. So I pursued external uh, advice and support and I researched to the end of the earth, <laughs> it felt, to find different ways to help my brain work better. I realised that uh, things were different. My brain worked differently, which it does. It's really good. At that young age, it rewired itself, which is very good. Uh, however, it does work. I do my brain work differently. Uh, and I yeah, went above and beyond to find those strategies to and create them in a lot of instances as well to recreate my life and build a future beyond trauma, <laughs> as I put it. Um, because I didn't want to be categorised as a victim and forever live in that bubble of victim. So now you're limited because you had a head, you've got a brain injury. So it's like, well, okay, hang on, what can I do now? What have I learnt? Mm. How can I be better? What more can I do? Was there any underlying fears, though, that interfered with that process of recovery? So imagine at 19 and then at 20, even at 21, at the moment, you know, for a little while, your life was on hold. Yeah. Then you started to get back into life. Was there kind of this, was there any underlying concerns about getting back into life before you started to really feel like you were, feel like you were really back into it? Yeah, absolutely. There was, uh, I remember confidence issues. Can I do this? And I challenged it. All right. Let's see if I can do it. Nothing to lose. Better than, than sitting here thinking I can't, not doing anything about it. So I'm very, very proud to say that I actually went back to work at the end of that same year. So, and I started, I went back to study a little bit, I think early the following year now, I can't completely remember. Decided that wasn't for me in the end. <laughs> Both industries decided it wasn't for me in the end. However, uh, it was a goal. I sort of set myself a goal because I'm thinking, well, best place to start is to see whether the life I had suit, suits me now. Uh, made a few changes. I mean, I was 19 anyway. I was pretty young. So, <laughs> however, it was for me, it was about challenging the limitations, making the decision to challenge limitations and see what I could do and what I was happy with. Um, confidence was definitely something that was a challenge. Um, uh, because a lot of the focus in rehabilitation is what you can't do and then trying to improve on that, um, whereas I needed to shift my focus onto, well, what can I do, what do I want to do, mm. uh, and, and how can I, as opposed to, okay, I used to do this like this, but maybe I can do it a different way now. Um, so, so really looking at, uh, at, at changing that. And confidence, I will be honest, physically too. I mean, you're talking about a 19-year-old girl who smashed her face in. Mm. I've had quite a bit of surgery since then too <laughs> to make so, myself look like me, yeah. So was there a little bit of scarring and bruising and swelling and all that kind of thing that you had to sort of give time to settle down? 
Yeah, well, initially, uh, my even when I left rehabilitation, the, my right eye was closed, so I, I lost the uh, nerve uh, movement to control it opening, and my eye was fixed and dilated, uh, so it didn't uh, move. That's a third nerve uh, palsy, partial uh, third nerve palsy, uh, and uh, paralysis. And um, over time, it started to open and it moved. Yeah. And you can see there's some a bit of vision doesn't completely move or go all the way up uh, so I have partial paralysis uh, however it, it did it opened uh, and again pushing the limits as I do uh, I remember you know going out with my friends I had half a shaved head put a hat on put a bit of makeup on my one eye at the time and I went out because I didn't want to miss out I didn't want to be sit there feeling sorry for myself. I can't do this because I've got one eye closed and I don't look like I used to. Okay, well, that's just going to make it even worse. So I got stared at a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that's I grew from that. I grew from that. Yeah. Yeah, I grew from that. But the, the, I challenged the lack of confidence because I'm more than that, I figured. Did you grow up quicker than you may have at the age of 19, then, you know, life kind of tends to um, get in the way sometimes of us being adolescent for as long as we can and being teenagers as long as we can and being all these things as long as we can. So I know that for me, becoming a dad at 22, bloody made me grow up quick, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, um, I reflect back on what that would have been like, what it would have been like if I hadn't had kids and my son who's 23 now. Wow. I, look, I look at him and I go, that's the same kind of idiot that I would have been, you know, which is perfectly <laughs> fine, perfectly fine as a good kid, but yeah. he just doesn't need to have any more responsibility because he's 23 and he's, and he's smart. He's not a dad um, at 23, right? <laughs> so, so how did it make you grow up quicker? Like what happened? In your, in the way that you approached just life generally after the accident. That's a that's a huge question and a, and a, and a really important one I think too. And, and one of the main things was you know that mortality lesson we gain as we get older. Wow. Yeah. I got hit with that like, you know, uh, oh my god, I'm not invincible. You know. <laughs> uh, that reality of life and death, we all know it. As we get older, we look back, gain a kind of acceptance around it, I suppose. At 19, I don't know that many of us are ready for that, especially being hit with it so so quickly and the fragility of, of life. So I found what was important to me changed very quickly. Uh, so listening for example, just some of my peers complain about things, you know, 19-year-old, 20-year-old things, which is relevant at the time, seemed like kind of, you know, not important to me because, like, well, yeah, you're worrying about what so-and-so said. My brain came, brain fluid came out my nose, really? Yeah? You're worried about having the latest whatever jacket or whatever. It's like uh, I'm glad my face is still on on my head you know <laughs> so to put it into context so that was a massive lesson to to realize that not everybody had that insight and that to to be able to say okay that's still important it's just important in a different way and for me to uh you know understand that uh you know, not everybody's going to have that same perception as I have because they haven't lived it. And also I was different. You know, my, my behaviour was was different uh, for some medical reasons as well for a while, uh, but also because of my perspective had changed, my, my interests and things changed. Uh, and I had to adjust to that. So that was, that was a, yeah, definitely a, definitely a challenge. Uh, However, my increased empathy helped to balance that because I had increased empathy following you know, that sort of trauma 
So that allowed me to go, okay, well, that's important to you. So, all right. But relating, that was that could be quite difficult. Yeah, that, that could be at 19. I, I know what you mean because it wasn't traumatic for me to become a dad at 22. It just became really a lot of responsibility. And then relating mm. to other kids at 23, at 22, and all those ages is like, shit, man. Like, you guys have got a completely different view of the world. And I appreciate it and understand it because I was there not that long ago, but I can't be like that anymore. I've got to be different because I have a different thing that's going on in my life. There's this bundle of joy that came into my life that is going to become not joyous very quickly if I remain the 21-year-old version of myself with the child. Mm. It won't work. No. Um, so I know what you mean about not being able to relate to people and they couldn't relate to me. So what that meant was that I lost a lot of those people. They kind of fizzled away and, and, and moved into different directions. And I totally get it. Maybe I was the one that moved into the direction that was different and they kind of stayed on their just their trajectory, their path to whatever the, the changes were that they were going to experience in their life later on, you know, marriage or responsibility and all that kind of stuff. Were you traumatized? So we, we, we're going to eventually get to the book, but it sounds like from the story that you've written and mm. I imagine reflecting back that there was underlying trauma, both physical and then I imagine emotional and the rest of it. Absolutely. There's a lot of trauma. Uh, the... My choice to focus on beyond trauma, to focus on uh, moving forward, uh, was because of that trauma and that pain. So if I talk about, if I reflect back on the physical trauma, so both the absolute physical agony of having my face smashed in and the worst part of the break being the skull base. So imagine the skull base, multiple fractures and breaks through there, through the sinuses. Um, and my face, like some lower jaw, upper jaw, cheekbone, around the eye orbit, my forehead, cheekbone, upper jaw and my nose, <laughs> you know, all being uh, smashed in basically. Um, and the surgeries after that to, to fix that, that is uh, in Oh, uh, <laughs> incredible amount of pain, and that's difficult. Uh, the the from from my perspective, you know, I've had my my face cut open on the inside to reconstruct my face. My face cut open, my head cut up, cut open for brain surgery. I've had tubes put into my brain and put into my through my skull. I've had tubes down my throat. I've had <laughs> thousands of scans and whatever done. These things are they're frightening because you don't know what the answer is going to be. The environment itself is frightening. Uh, am I going to be all right? Can I, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to get sick with bacterial meningitis of the brain and die 10 years later? Um, and then will my life ever be the same? You know, 19, am I ever going to look normal? You know, I'm the first time, and I've put this in my book as well and written about this before, you know, in other instances where, a real pivotal moment for me was in the rehab centre and you know, the fogginess had cleared from all the drugs and I, I went up to the mirror for the first time because they covered the mirrors in the uh, hospital. Wow. Oh, yeah, because I, I had I, don't, I have a dream-like memory of it because I was out of it, you know, swelling and stuff in the brain and, and all the medicine. And I, I apparently I, like I, say, I have a dream-like memory of it. I did see... Uh, my reflection and it was when you know I freaked out understandably so the doctors and nurses covered all the mirrors in the hospital so one of the first times I looked at my reflection was in the rehab centre I was on my own for the first time god knows when it was and I had a little basin in my room and a little mirror and I went up and and I looked and really looked you know and I cried you know my half my head was shaven I had long hair like I do now my head was shaven and 
the side of my face was sunken and lower. My eyelid was closed. Still some bruising and things. And I thought, oh, whoa, okay. And I thought, well, what are you going to do now? This isn't it. What are you going to do now? And that was pivotal because it was like I made that decision then and there. I'm not giving up on this either. Because my instinct was never to give up on my life. That was instinctual. That was like, I'm going to fight. That was the drips. I'm escaping. I'm not a victim. That part, though, that, oh, God, my, yeah, I'm not giving up on that either. That's not what I look like. And, well, that's not what I look like now either. So, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> trauma would have been from the accident and then it would have been reflecting from the accident and then it would have been as a result of multiple surgeries and looking at yourself for the first time and coming to terms with all the differences and what you're noticing. Yep. It would have yep. probably been because of the way that other people saw you, reacted to you, um, spoke to you, treated you. Yep. Some of these traumas may, may have been building one on top of the other, on, onto the other. Were you seeking um, psychological counselling or some other kind of support in those early days to help you through or did you miss out on that stuff? That's a good question. And I found that uh, there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of initial sort of support and, and uh, uh, then you sort of go off to your own, like she's all right now, tick, you know. Right. And, um, and again, because I'm very focused and was very, you know, getting on with things. Things raise their ugly head, so to speak, uh, a little later. So I was so busy trying to steam train, getting my life back and, you know, um, reviewing this and reviewing that and what's working and surgeries and all sorts of things. And then it sort of, I started to realise changes in my behaviour, uh, panic attacks, uh, flashback type things, I'm talking about, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> symptoms, so to speak. Um, so, which, uh, you know, it definitely uh, started to to interfere with my life. So I sought uh, some professional help, absolutely. And, and I have in different times, done lots of research myself. Um, I've sought, uh, sought uh, some more conventional and unconventional methods uh, as well. So, you know, things like kinesiology and acupuncture, um, you know, meditation, exercise, these sorts of things as well. Um, but for me, a big part of it was uh, getting my own research into how the brain works and how our human behaviour and how that works and that consequently led to further study and now my professional career <laughs> as well. Uh, however, that was that was something that was, um, was important to me to understand it, understand the trauma. I had an awareness that I was different. This was affecting my life. So I sought out ways to work with that and understand it so as I could improve myself and uh and work with that um and you know the the trauma trauma is more so many layers to trauma so many layers um you know hemorrhaging after surgery for example isn't a lot of fun you know <laughs> it goes on it's not the just the accident and the recovery itself it's what happens after it's adjusting to my brain working differently it's adjusting to my new lifestyle it's getting strong again it's uh it's dealing with uh, anxiety and flashbacks and, and dreams and, yeah, there's a lot of elements to the actual trauma part. Yeah, you, a lot of stroke survivors are going to relate to what you're saying because I know you didn't have a stroke but you had experienced the massive trauma. It came out of nowhere. Everything was okay one day. It wasn't okay the next day. And then it continued to not necessarily be okay for many, many days after that, years even. And in that oh. scenario that process in that in that scenario that process creates a situation where um where there's so many things that you haven't experienced or learnt about in life and they're all coming at you at one time and it can be overwhelming yes. so um when i when i was a young kid when i was a young kid sorry yeah i was a young kid at 25 you know 4 years into being a dad and having all these dad experiences, 
mortgage, work, all mm. the stuff that comes with it so young, I was lacking resources. And when I would go back to refer to the people that were in my life for support and advice, they couldn't really give me any support and advice. Sure, my dad would say, just work more and make more money and do all that kind of stuff. And that worked for him, but it wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for something else, you know, more emotional, something deeper. So mm. I went to counseling as well. And I've never really stopped going to counseling. I'm 46 this year. And I can say that I've been consistently seeing somebody about something all the time. But early on in those days, I did what you did. I became curious to understand. And the more I understood, the better I felt about things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wanted to understand was why I had such an inability to communicate with people and mm -hmm. feel comfortable with the way that they spoke back to me and communicated to me and why mm -hmm. they would use certain words and act up a certain way and think it was okay to treat me a certain way. Mm. And I used to go to counseling and ask my counselor, why do people behave in that way? They, she didn't know any of the people that I knew, but she was able to give me a psychologist's approach to why behavior occurs. And then she was mm. able to give me the layers of underneath that, what's underneath that, you know, what, what happened before they walked into the room that I'm not aware of that may have made them trigger a conversation that made them speak to me like that. And when I understood that, it made it better. And then I yeah. went out and sought out the same kind of approach to understanding what happened with stroke. My brain yeah. bled. What does that area that bleed, what does that impact? What does that yeah. mean for this, that, and the other? And the more I understood, the more I'm able to adjust my life find ways to get around the problem and then implement a strategy that's going to support me in this new way. It just sounds exactly like you, yes. you did, you know, yeah. and I like the fact that we are similar in that way. It just, yeah. it's fascinating. It is. It is. And, and, and I mean, you're spot on. I'm, I'm nodding and, and smiling at you while you're saying this, uh, because it makes me think of uh, specifically with, with myself very much related to what you just said there. Um, in that, you know, with my brain injury, it was uh, frontal lobe. So that's the, you know, um, behavioral part, having the ability to have insight. That's here. <laughs> so a lot of the time with brain injuries, uh, uh, individuals lose that ability of insight. And part of the rehabilitation process is to help them regain that where they can. I'm very fortunate in that um, I was pretty, pretty, still pretty young. Um, so the brain rewired quite well. So I, I, um, I still have the ability to move inside, which is fantastic. In terms of personality change, because uh, people talk a lot about personality change when it comes to brain injuries and, and uh, sort of brain injuries that I had as well. And a lot of the time it's uh, perspective based as well. It's the experience itself that changes someone's perspective and the way they behave. Sometimes it is. In the frontal lobe with the insight uh, a lot of the time and this applies to me a little bit is that it, uh, it uh, certain uh, primal traits uh, your, your instinctual traits I suppose if you think about it that way are exaggerated so personality um, traits are exaggerated so with me I've um, always been an extroverted strong willed personality that became uh, stronger in me than it was before. Uh, so I'm aware of it though, so I can turn myself down. So usually, um, perhaps in those first couple of years, I was perhaps behavior a little bit like this, a bit, a bit more out there in some ways, uh, because my brain was still healing as well. Uh, and then having that ability of, uh, of insight and, and going, I suppose, uh, the extra mile, you know, going, hang on, something's off here, I get up overly upset or I get, um, you know, I can be a little bit too, however, whatever it is. Having the ability, thankfully, to, to look at that and then do the research, you know, sort out experts and read and research, do everything I possibly could to then understand why and put in the strategies to, to deal with that um, and understand what's appropriate and what's not. I've always understood what's appropriate and what's not. However, I can now uh, not be as ruled, perhaps, by certain emotions and things um, in terms of behaviour. So, 
How old are you now? Oh, <gasps> you know, never to ask a lady her age. Just kidding, I don't care. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I just turned 40 in January. All right, so you just turned 40 in January. This happened to you 21 years ago. Mm. And at what point did you think you're going to reflect on it in this way by making a book and put it in writing? When did you get to that stage? That's interesting. Um, it was something that was developing over time. So I found, uh, I started becoming the go-to person for advice from a lot of people. And uh, the increased empathy and wanting to help others just kept kept growing. And when I'd seen, you know, people in hospital waiting rooms, because as you can imagine, I've had lots of follow-up appointments. I still do follow-up appointments, uh, not not brain-wise, thankfully, uh, which is good now. Um, however, uh, in terms of you know, my eye and face and stuff. Um, so, um, but, you know, for those first few years, especially the first 10 years following, numerous follow-up appointments and making sure that I was okay and everything was working, um, and just seeing some of the people in the waiting rooms and in the rehabilitation centre that, you know, just felt like, how could I help? And, and then people struggling in their lives with, with other stresses and, and traumas and just really thinking, you know, how can I help, you know, with what I, I've been through and, and looking at finding that when I shared my story with people, they were saying, oh, my Goodness, you've helped me so much. If you can get through that, you know, then I can get through whatever it is. And thinking, well, hang on, I've got strategies that I can help you with. So, you know, that, that started to evolve over the years. And then um, I started working in uh, professional education and training. Uh, and I uh, saw uh, a medium there, if you will. And um, the more personal uh, professional development I did on my own accord, you know, uh, I led me to, to thinking, well, I've got to get it out of my head and into something. So that was probably, I started thinking about it probably about 10 years ago. We started thinking about it about 10 years ago and it evolved. Uh, I had grand plans, grand plans of writing my book while pregnant uh, with my first child, <laughs> which I was, in, I had my first child at 35. So I have little ones. You have older children, I have little ones. Yeah. Um, that wasn't to be. I, I, I suppose there's more trauma there in that I had a horrendous pregnancy, uh, hospitalised, hyperemesis, low blood pressure, couldn't drive. I was throwing up blood. It was really not a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, another trauma with the birth of my first child who ended up, in uh, the Royal Children's, which I won't go into, but that was, yeah, another, yes, very painful <laughs> thing to go through. She's she's fine, by the way, thankfully. She's excellent. excellent. Uh, picked up a few things afterwards, but, of course, I had my second child. Uh, so one's, one's five, one's three, uh, in my late 30s, and that was another horrendous pregnancy where I couldn't walk and hospitals and all sorts of things. Uh, I could barely walk and barely get off the couch. Uh, vomiting again, that was fun. Uh, so that, of course, you know, uh, slow January, but I kept going and, yeah, I eventually got it out. Um, you know, late, late, uh, late last year it was finalised and I just kept chipping away at things and kept chipping away and I sort of, I did what, what the, the core of my, my coaching and, and my message, I suppose, is, which is that, you know, finding the lesson within your trauma and that's, I focused on that and I took what I'd learnt in those other challenges and it only added to my insight for my book and my workshops. It only added to my understanding of even myself uh, and how I, I operate and how my brain works as well and how the trauma has affected me and where it flares up again, what triggers I've got that I didn't know I had even um, some additional ones. Uh, so that just added to my purpose, my, my passion. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I love that. I love that it took you 
best part of nine years be from the idea to the end concept, the end product. And yeah. why I love that is because that's a beautiful thing. It's a great story. And it's a great thing to tell people who are recovering that don't put a timeline on something. Have the idea and let it just let it evolve and let it emerge. And and and, and if it's something that you're meant to do, it'll happen. Whether it takes five years, two years, one year, seven years, it doesn't matter. What matters is that it's a goal. And if you put a timeline on it and you don't achieve it, you're going to be disappointed at that timeline. Mm. And recovery from a trauma, stroke, anything dramatic, I don't believe should have timelines. It just should have a goal that, that one day I want to achieve this. I don't know when. And the reason we don't want to know when is because we don't want to feel disappointed when we get there. And if you're the kind of person who allows yourself to get down about that kind of stuff, just don't put a timeline on it. Just say that you will get better and just make it happen whenever it happens. Same with the book, you know. Um, was it therapeutic to write the book? Did it do more than just allow you to get all your thoughts into pages? Oh, uh, yeah. It was uh, therapeutic in a very painful way uh, because uh, I, I got the, uh, all the medical records from the Alfred uh, hospital wow. and when I read through, and when I read through them it was worse than I understood prior my injuries were worse and it brought back all sorts of things uh, so oh, looking at all of that and reading all of that was was confronting uh, however I grew from that and I gained more insight about myself as well and my injuries and also, uh, I suppose I, I gained the insight about myself where I saw just what I'd achieved. It was far worse than even I realised when I read the actual injury to the brain as well. Um, and perhaps I had never really given myself any credit for what I'd achieved because I just kept focusing on building up I'm not a victim I'm going to rebuild my life and I'm going to learn and I'm going to which held me in a very good yeah. you know very, very good place however I wasn't stopping to uh well I'll say smell the roses but I'm actually an awesome mix I have no smell now but <laughs> after the surgery and the brain injury um however as the saying goes uh stop to smell the roses uh and really sort of say hey Deb you know survived a lot um so that that was yeah it was uh a painfully healing process which wow. is again at the the core of of my message and you know beyond trauma and turning tragedy into opportunity so what, what, what is what is there beyond trauma what is there that's a good question. That varies for everybody. It's specific. The way I look at it is this, and, and I'll, I'll go to a, a term that I use, which is also the name of my business, which is tragic opportunities. So that is creating opportunities from trauma. So the tragedy is the, the injury, the pain, the suffering, the stress, whatever that is. Uh, the, the opportunity is what we can learn from that what insight we can gain from that and how we choose to use that knowledge to make better decisions, improve ourselves, improve our life, our relationships, et cetera, how we use that information. So that's what is beyond trauma, recognising what, what you have achieved, what I, what I have achieved, recognising that, looking at the lesson learned, taking that information and making informed decisions. So I'm not who I was. I'm not necessarily who I was going to be, the direction. I'm still me. I'm Deb. Deb's more than, you know, the label that I had on myself. I'm not big on labels now <laughs> after, after this. You know, I'm more than, you know, the fashion student or the real estate age. I wasn't really an agent then. I was too young. But at the time, I was doing bits and pieces, land sales and things. Uh, that I'm, I'm not what I do. I'm me. Yeah. And as me, I can choose to do what I want 
I can choose to be the best version of me. And that's what's beyond trauma. It's almost like freedom. The trauma almost gave me freedom to go, you know what, these, those labels of shoulds and who you are being, what you do and things, you know what, that stuff doesn't matter. So I, can, I could authentically reinvent myself and just go for it. Yeah, I like that. It reminds me of a process that I go through with people at coaching, you know, who are really afraid to delve into what's scary and, and mm. what they're uncomfortable with because they're in pain, but they have this idea that it's more painful to where about they're going to go. And I get it. it. It is more painful, but it's only more painful for a short amount of time, whereas before you go there, it's painful all the time. Yeah. So going there gets you an idea to kind of face the beast. And then after that, it's nothing. And that's where this relief exists. Yes. And if you get a taste of that, if you allow me to support you so that you can go there once and get a taste for it, then you're not going to stop. You're going to continue seeking the relief from every traumatic experience that you've had in your life. And you're going to be less afraid to to go into that place where it's you know scary where it's dark and where it's not comfortable you know yeah so i i love your answer to what is beyond trauma you know relief and this new opportunity to start anything you want and no labels that is the most amazing part like that's really what's there no labels because i came from trauma and in trauma i was traumatized i was afraid i was this i was that and now there's no labels and now I can create a new, more empowering set of labels that I can use to benefit me and that I'm going to um, make the most of now that I don't have this trauma um, yeah. hanging around. Yeah. Do me a favor. Can you grab the book and bring it to your camera so that we can see it um, close up? Because sure. it's a great cover. See if I can. The lighting's not great. Yeah, perfect. Is it uh, lighting okay like that? That's perfect. I love it. Is that a little bit uh, Terminator or is it a little bit Six Million Dollar Woman? Like what's going on there? That is, um, it's an image I had in my mind for a long time uh, because for me it's symbolic. So th that's my skull, obviously, with all the, I don't know whether you, how much you can see on that with all the metal pins and the four by 10 centimetre hole that was cut in my forehead from the brain surgery. Wow. Um, so that is, you know, that is me. So that's showing what's underneath. This is who I choose to be. Yeah. There's a lot of assumption that, that could be made about the life of someone with these injuries. Yeah. And this is me going, this is me. I look just like kind of everybody else, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, in, an <laughs> you know, evolved, in an evolved kind of way. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's it's uh, something that you were saying before. I think it's actually really important here, which is that I've always been about facing the painful, ugly truth. Because it's, it's somewhat a cliche saying, but the only way out is through. Yeah. You know, so that is feel the pain, go through it. That's how you're going to learn. That's how it's not going to hurt anymore. The only way to not experience the trauma is to experience the trauma, so to speak. Get through it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's still there. Um, and uh, that's the same with triggers. So with PTSD, when I have certain things that trigger me and I need to, I've worked on, what it is sometimes it's not so it's not obvious and I've, I've done um, some additional work on that more recently as well and um, some very very painful things came up however the only way to get past that was to sit with it to sit with the actual memory that was dormant I suppose mm. sit with that and remember it and curl up in a ball on my floor and cry my eyes out but now when I think about it it doesn't hurt anymore yeah, and it beautiful. doesn't I don't get triggered like that anymore with certain instances or sounds or visual things. So that, that's an example of, of that. 
um, as well. So, um, and the cover for me was important because for many years I sort of was so much focus on hiding, so to speak, what, what happened, you know, fix my face was I look like I used to and those sorts of things and um, not wanting people to notice. However, by putting that on the cover, I hope to almost, well, I suppose inspire and, and show others that it's okay to own your pain, own the ugly truth. And our scars actually make us beautiful because that's where we grow as well. Um, and, and it's not something that I need to hide. Yeah. Deborah, that's a beautiful way to end the podcast. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing your story and giving us the insights into what happens after a traumatic experience and how to get beyond it. Tell me, if somebody wanted to um, connect with you, where's the best place for them to go? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so my website, uh, which is um, obviously is, is one place, but certainly um, my via email is a great way of doing it. Um, but certainly I have a Facebook page, which is um, Tragic Opportunities by Deborah Stathis. I have, I'm on Instagram as well, which is uh, the same title. Um, my website is uh, tragicopportunities.com. Um, and of course, yeah, email, which is info at tragicopportunities.com. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much as well. It's been absolutely fantastic um, speaking. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.